Hello, everybody. My name is Nicole Goldfarb, and I'm a speech language pathologist and certified oral facial myologist. And we are here with Airway Answers, expanding your breadth of knowledge. And this uh, visual podcast is through Airway Circle Radio. So we thank everyone for joining us today. And I have the pleasure of introducing and interviewing Dr. Ilya Lipkin. Um, probably most of you have heard of him before, the MSC expert. Um, and let's let me do a little bio introduction. Um, Dr. Ilya Lipkin is an orthodontic specialist and dental facial orthopedist um, with over 20 years of clinical experience in private practice. He earned his dental degree at NYU College of Dentistry and completed his dental residency in orthodontics in the postgraduate orthodontic department in 2001. And he has a practice in Emerson, New Jersey, correct? That- Actually, West, Westwood. Okay, West, and that's New Jersey? Which is, it used to be Emerson. (laughs) Okay, it used to be Emerson. Okay, in New Jersey. And um, Dr. Lipkin lectures nationally and internationally on multiple orthodontic topics, including, but not limited to, skeletal expansion, which will be a big uh, topic we talk about today, Um, airway, TMJ, and various orthodontic techniques and technologies. Um, So... Before I start the um, talking to Dr. Lipkin, Dr. Ting, who is my orthodontist that did my MSc um, a couple of years ago, wanted me to make sure when I introduced Dr. Dr. Lipkin to say that Dr. Lipkin is the best orthodontist Dr. Ting has ever known. <laughs> so that speaks <laughs> volumes. So it's great. I Thank feel you. Like <laughs> you both are like MSc skeletal expansion experts. So um, I feel like a big thing right now is. MSC, MARPI, skeletal expansion. It's just a very popular, um, amazing technique right now. And a lot of people have questions. Um, in fact, when I was checking Facebook today, in some group, uh, some cranial facial group, someone posed a question that was solely about Dr. Dr. Lipkin and your technique. So I might be able to ask that here, <laughs> which was kind of fun that I saw that today. Um, so let's get started. I'm curious how you became interested in MSC and sort of a shift from maybe more traditional orthodontic techniques to uh, airway focused. I mean, it's it's always it's uh, we always did expansions since from from the day one in the in the practice. I uh, you know eventually just when I graduated and and the, and the person I bought the practice from uh, you know ex- even in even in some of the cases where we treated patients with extractions we still did expansion um so so um essentially but you there's a limitation of how far you could you you know how old the child should be uh to get expansion that's going to be stable and uh, it's going to stay long term so when the tags came out the mini the mini implants uh I, i learned those back in 2007 uh, and then in 2010, I saw an article uh, by Dr. Wan Moon, actually a couple of articles uh, about the MSC and, and TAD supported expanders. So that's, uh, and then I tried my first one uh, in 2012. So that was basically just for gaining space, uh, making room for, for teeth, take, you know, improving, getting a wider aesthetic outcome and, um, you know, airway certainly was was not a big part of it, uh, but some patients started to reporting signs and symptoms of improvement, and lay pop went off. Okay, so, so that's yeah. actually interesting because it was first um, the skeletal expansion was more like sort of an aesthetic or cosmetic, getting this space. Well, it just it just it just allowed me to do expansion on the kids that or young adults that were not growing. You know, mm-hmm. initially it would, it would be like a, a, a middle to late teens, like okay. in, you know, my early, you know, 20, you know, from between 2012 and 2015. And in 2015, inspired by Dr. Ting, mm-hmm. I tried uh, the MSC on the adult and that worked. So uh, I just, uh, you know, became a major tool in my uh, toolbox. And then patients started reporting better breathing or other... Uh, airway. Yeah, so, yeah, a lot of patients started saying, "Oh, I stopped snoring. I, I I feel better. I feel I can breathe through my nose so much better." And in the kid, in some of the younger patients, which we tried that, uh, let's say they had uh, really significant underbites, and uh, those uh, you know very unpredictable with the conventional expanders. And, and so I tried those on the younger kids. Uh, you know, tad support expanders, and that worked really well. 
So I was very much inspired. And then when your parent tells you, oh, my child was three percentile growth and now they're 50th percentile and they stop snoring and this again, it's just, uh, just adds on. Yeah. And what is the youngest age you would do a TAD supported expander? It's an excellent question. Renata and Naomi asked me that yesterday. Oh, <laughs> we're uh, always on the same page. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. I, I've, I've done multiple seven, you know, eight year olds. The youngest I've done was five. It oh, was wow. someone who's, uh, who has an extreme, I mean, this is an extreme case. Uh, it was a, a very severe uh, case. So, uh, you know, both underbites and, and width. It was uh, so, it, it, I felt that conventional expansion would just not do what it's what you should what you should get so uh, mom who was a, a marpy patient herself and an orthognatic surgery patient herself uh, she said I don't want my daughter to have what I've thought what I've had so she actually the one who suggested if we should do a, a marpy on, on her daughter and then we did and then the results been out, out been amazing and wow and so do you feel the results may not have been as good doing traditional tooth borne expansion Probably not. And not only that, it's just, you know, the tooth point uh, expanders have limitations. At some point, uh, the maxilla starts, stops expanding and the teeth start to move. Mm -hmm. So if you do, you know, every, you know, it's, it's, it's been reported in literature that when you do a conventional expansion, uh, even on younger kids, you, you lose about half mm. long term. So, okay. you know, if this girl, for example, the width of her palate was 24 millimeters in a normal 36 to 40, uh, then, uh, you know, if we would have done 10 millimeters and got her to 35 and she would lose, uh, you know, five, five, and then, you know, it would just would not be adequate. Okay. So basically when you go back to like upright the teeth after they've been, been tipped, then you're losing that expansion. When you Not do only that, it's just it's just because the conventional expander, it's pressure through the teeth onto the bone. Mm -hmm. So at some point, uh, at some point, the pressure from everything else on the bone uh, stops allowing the bones to move, and then you get tooth movement. Mm -hmm. Or even after after, after you stop turning, um, you know the pressure is still there, but it's not. You know, teeth are not set in bones. Te teeth will move. Yeah. So the, the bones move back, but the teeth stay out. <laughs> Yeah. And so for the five-year-old, how many TADs did that five-year-old have? Two. Okay. And then what age do you start using four or more TADs? Uh, it would be, it would be uh, uh, based on, you know, depends on how thick the bone is, depends on if we're planning to use Marpy for something else, like, okay. uh, you know, Anchorage and so on. So that's just uh, up until maybe the age of 10, 11, I, I could use just two. Okay. And MSC would just be four tabs, right? But then Marpy is more customized where then you could go six, eight, like that. Um, I, 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 I used to customize before, before we had a, the, the, you know, uh, orthodontic lab like partners, I used to customize my own MSCs. I used to, I have a laser welder, so I would just add tabs and I've done my own six, eight tabs. It's based off regular conventional MSC. Okay. And what is the oldest age that you've done the TAD expansion where you've had success? 63. Okay. That's amazing. And so for the adults, do you have to use a piezo or some other technique to help the suture split? Uh, yes, it will make it more predictable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What age do you typically have to start using um, piezo? piezo? Yeah. Uh, so usually for for males, I would start at the age of twenty five, and for females, over thirty. And some people will probably debate me on this. And they, chances are, they you know even you know especially in women, uh, the maxilla will split even without piezo. Uh, but uh, you know, I was talking to Marianne Evans the other day, and and then she said, uh, you know, I, I I don't do piezo as often. Uh, and uh, most of my patients split except one. And I said, well, the reason I do piezo is because I don't want to have that one. That one. <laughs> hey, this is great. So this is interesting. I did see um, uh, someone who just had uh, an adult male had a Marpy install with Dr. Evans just, I think, yesterday. And I, I asked the question, did you use piezo? I, was, I wasn't sure. Um, it didn't look like it. So it sounds like she's not even needing it as often as maybe... We once thought. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the procedure is, is so 
non-invasive and so I, I dare to say simple okay. that, uh, you know, it takes maybe five, ten extra minutes uh, of, of the total uh, chair time. So if that helps me to eliminate that one page, that one uncertainty, I will use it. So let's, um, can you explain the piezo and what that is for listeners that might not know? Uh, it's a basically an ultrasonic knife. Uh, and uh, we used before before uh, before we used piezo for scalable expansion. We used to do uh, something that's called cordipunctures, meaning we used to do just perforations right along the midline, uh, which was extremely tedious, extremely slow, uh, and also extremely unpredictable. Uh, yeah. So this podcast is brought to you by the members of Airy Circle, the premier community for healthcare professionals passionate about Airy Health. If you're a medical professional looking to enhance your knowledge and stay ahead in the rapidly evolving field of airway health, we've got something special for you. By joining the Airway Circle membership, you're not only helping us bring this podcast and our professional directory to the public at no charge, you'll also gain exclusive access to a treasure trove of knowledge with hundreds of expert lectures. Whether you're a seasoned practitioner or just starting your journey, our diverse range of topics covers everything from breathing, craniofacial development, myofunctional therapy, palato expansion, to oral ties, sleep, and gut health. We would like to extend our gratitude to a few of our loyal listeners who share Airy Circle with their colleagues. To claim a free month of Airy Circle membership, visit www.airycircle.com and use the code Airway Answers. But don't delay because this offer is limited to five lucky individuals every month. And that's not all. As a member, you become part of a vibrant community of like minded professionals, have the opportunity to learn from experts, participate in live QA sessions, and engage in discussions that would deepen your understanding of Airway Health. So don't miss out. Join Airy Circle membership today and come grow with us. Airy Circle, where knowledge meets community. These are, it's, it's basically same perforations, just more efficient. Okay. And it's much, just much like, quicker. Like a straight line, a straight cut. Is there a yeah, lot of bleeding? I mean, we, we, there's no bleeding at all. Uh, we used to do it uh, much more aggressively in, in, in early. In the early cases, uh, I, I think, and I've seen sometimes patients, you know, some of the, my, some of the colleagues keep posting the cases. Sometimes they still go too aggressively, but uh, it's, it's, you know, doesn't need to be that aggressive. Um, uh, so it's, it's not, no, there's no bleeding. It's, okay. it's really pretty uncomplicated. And what do you mean aggressive? Like, how would you be more or less? Oh, they, they would used to do just like the, they will just split the entire maxilla literally with the PSG. Oh. And you don't have to go all the way back in your technique, or uh, no, you just don't have to do. Don't have to make it that that, that you know that continuous, that deep, that uh, that long. Yeah. It's it's uh, that requires much, especially with the custom marpies, requires much less uh, invasiveness. Okay, like a shorter depth. And then, do you do that um, the piezo before installing the appliance? Yeah. Okay. Right, right before. Okay. Um, so I had my MSC, I think it was two years ago, maybe a little bit less. And I was pre piezo. So I got to have the joy of 18 quarter punctures. I think actually Dr. T, okay. he did 17. And I was like, just do one more. So we end on an even number, just my little superstition. <laughs> but that was um, uncomfortable. And he said, now it's not, it's not as painful with the piezo as it was with quarter punctures. That's punctures. true. Very true. Great. Well, that's great for me that I had to do that. But either way, it wasn't even that bad at all. It wasn't. And you're numb. And then later, you know, over the counter um, medication like Tylenol. Um, worked. Yeah, most patients, most patients uh, with an extremely rare exception say that uh, they would always expect it to be worse than it actually was. Do you prescribe a painkiller after um, or just over the counter medication? Uh, just just over the counter. I have never, nobody, ever, I mean, there was one patient who she, she was, I mean, I would say maybe she just was more sensitive than other patients. So she, on a second day, post piezo, she said that she was in, in, in significant pain. 
So I, I prescribed her something strong, which uh, like a Vicodin, which she never actually picked up because by the time she got there, pain went away. That went away. Okay. Yeah. It almost seems like for things like that, if you beat the pain before it gets to you, like take that Tylenol yeah. or Advil before, usually have it under control. And it's funny because I talk a lot about the skeletal expansion because I, to me, this makes the most sense, like as a maybe avoiding jaw surgery option for a lot of adults. So when I did my MSC, I did it with my son who was eight. So we both did that together. So I get so many people contacting me, parents wanting to do it with their child. So yesterday, a mother is going to get the piezo with her 15-year-old daughter. So it's like a family a family affair. Um, so people are asking <laughs> all these questions, like how much time do I have to take off work? How much pain is there? Um, do you typically tell your patients they have to take off work for a few days? or uh, here? Um, not typically, but if, if, I mean, most patients would, they always ask about the pain factor. Uh, and it's usually the first day, you know, the, the day off placement and the, and the day after. Uh, if, I'm, it's always best to take off a, a day if, uh, you know, if, 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 they, if they feel very uncomfortable or just in case. Uh, I've had some patients went back to work the, the next day. So, you know, it, it kind of varies. Okay. And then when you install it, then do you start turning for the patient at the installation and then have them turn daily or is it possible? I, 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 I actually, I used to turn right away. Uh, I, I do, I no more, no longer do that. Uh, so we usually start turning about four or five days after the okay. installation. Okay. Um, so what are some of the changes in this type of skeletal bone expansion that have occurred over the years? It sounds like we went from portopunctures to piezo, um, maybe adding more tads. What are other changes that you've experienced in technique? Well, it's, 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 it, you know, you start analyzing your own failures, right? So I started using MSCs and initially I was very successful. Uh, probably because I didn't follow the protocols that were written in the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's <laughs> um, a good lesson. Uh, uh, yeah. So it, essentially, what, what what the way I was placing it, where it made sense, and and, and it, it turns out if if I were to do it by the you know original protocol, uh, I would have done it. You know, I would not have had a success. So then then you start uh, reading about it a little bit more, and then you know seeing placements, and then you start trying it that way or or various different ways, and and then when it fails, you start analyzing. So in some of my failures, I started adding more tads or, or putting them in different spots or adding little eyelets uh, to to increase the number of tads. Um, I even tried double uh, a double MSCs be, before the before the custom ones were available. I still use uh, conventional MSDs on, on, on younger kids. For adults, that's that's only custom. Okay. Uh, and then and then the customization uh, because it allows you to to see where you're placing the tabs, uh, and you it allows you to see where the bone is. It's 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 the precision's gotten over just literally just last two two three years uh, when it became absolutely incredible. That's uh, so. Yeah, so it, so because, so it's uh, now with the customs, it, it not only allows you to do the expansion, but you can certain uh, add certain parts to it. Let's say for intrusion, for retraction, to you know treat gummy smiles, severe protrusion, and so on. Okay. So um, they much more versatile. The, okay, so there, yeah, it's just way more customized. It sounds like, and when yeah. you maybe add more tads for certain patients, what's the most amount of tads you've done? Uh, usually eight. I eight? mean, that's my on 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 adults over at least thirty. That's that's my go to. Wow. Okay. To okay. And then if you do the piezo on all of them, are you, are you getting a hundred percent success rate since you've been doing that? Uh, la last two years, I've had a hundred percent success. Woo. Okay, that's a big deal. So last two years. You have never had a patient that's and success being suture split, right? That's how we yep. would define success. Yep. Exactly. That's amazing. That's Including Dr. Ting himself. <laughs> there you go. I remember when I went to see him, I think he had just seen you. So all so suture split and all up to age 63. And older ages, um, have you not tried or it's less successful beyond the age of 63 or no, I just did not have a patient who was who got older who uh, would who would agree to uh, do the marketing. Interesting. If, 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 if tomorrow, like yesterday, I had a 72-year-old. 
Okay. He's thinking about it. If he's going to go for it, I'll do it. So, okay. I don't so, think I, I, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't I wouldn't use age as a limit. Okay. So there wouldn't be an age where you'd say no, like a 75 year old, you would, if they're willing, the bone seems fine. I mean, you, you, have, you have to consider the risks. Obviously, yeah. you know, for, for 72 is the healing, the age, the, mm -hmm. you know, what the, the, the implications of possible uh, other things like, you know, healing and infection. Uh, yeah. uh, so that, that those are considerations. For example, if Tomorrow, the 82, per, 82 year old will, will come and they have diabetes and this and that. And, you know, probably even though it might be the case, I might I might not do it just for those for those reasons. Right. And um, osteoarthritis, things like that, you would have. That oh, yeah, there's multiple, multiple little things that need okay. to be considered. Okay. So do you think when you're doing transverse expansion with these bone borne expanders, are you getting any AP growth? Uh, well, you, you could affect the AP, AP, AP change, absolutely, with, whether it's using a face mask or some, you know, there are other contraptions that you could do. But, so you need uh, to add on something. You wouldn't naturally yeah, yeah. get any forward growth with just an... Right. I mean, with the pure expansion only, no face mask, nothing, you're still going to get a, a teeny bit AP change. That's just a, uh, because the, that's how maxilla expands. Okay, can you explain that a little more? So that's interesting. So doing the transverse, you will get a bit of forward growth. I mean, it's microscopic, maybe a millimeter okay. or so. But yeah, the, there is there is a little bit of a forward change. Okay, and in children, that's true for even RPE, right? When you do any, is that more yes. prominent in a child than in an adult that you're going to get forward growth from transverse expander? Not Not forward growth, just forward change from the expansion. Forward change. What What do you mean? Forward change. Forward, forward displacement. Growth implies, you know, it's a growing. Okay. okay. You know, that's that's not it's not growth. It's just a displacement. The, okay. This is really interesting. Forward displacement. So, what's going forward? <laughs> uh, the maxilla. The maxilla get you know from the from the research that even before the marpies. Yeah. In a in, in a conventional expander, the max, the upper jaw, the maxilla gets displaced. Uh, uh, the slightly forward by about a, maybe half a millimeter, millimeter. I, I forget exact numbers. Okay, but, but you, do, you do get you get you do get some AP change uh, from just doing expansion alone. Yeah, because I remember hearing a little bit of research on that. I think Kevin, Doctor Kevin Boy, talks about that as well in mm -hmm. children, um, which could potentially maybe cause some of that tonsil and anoid reduction as well. That decrease in airflow resistance. Good. Could, could be, could be. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So when I had my MSC, I felt that I got some forward growth. And for me, it felt like my tongue was no longer crammed back because perhaps it could come wider and then come forward versus just cramming back. So I felt like I could breathe better. Um, even like, uh, like tipping my chin down, I could get airflow where I couldn't get any air through my nose with my chin down without going into a class three. So I, I felt this a little bit of forward change, perhaps as a byproduct of having more space for the tongue. Um, interesting. Sure. So do you think the um, these Tadborn expanders can eliminate the need for jaw surgery in patients? And I mean like a double jaw surgery potential patient due to sleep apnea or airway issues? I mean, in some instances, it, it can. I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, the, the surgery would always be a gold standard mm -hmm. for, for sleep apnea patients. So, um, and, in, and the sleep, you know, in general, the airway has so many different levels. Uh, so for some patients, just expansion and a face mask uh, would work. And I've seen that happen. Um, and for some patients, that might not be adequate. It all depends on the jaw structure because someone who's got a recessed lower jaw and their posterior airway is narrow, you could expand, you know, into infinity and it, that will never improve. Is um, this type of mid palatal sutra, sutural expansion a good precursor if someone needs jaw surgery? Oh, yeah, because a lot of patients have, if, if they do have a transverse discrepancy, then uh, you know certainly Marpy in, in comparison to doing a surgical ex surgically assisted expansion, it's it's way 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 better. You Can know you because surgery, mm -hmm. yeah, with the surgery, you know, before we used before we had Marpies, we used to for for cases that had transverse discrepancy, 
we either used uh, surgically assisted expansion, where literally the surgeon just splits the maxilla in a couple of pieces, and we use a conventional expander to split it. The procedure is extremely painful um, and extremely, you know, extremely invasive. It's basically the uh, same orthognotic surgery because they do the cuts in the middle and 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 uh, the, the zygomatic bones. And uh, I usually, again, in my experience uh, personally, I patients that had surgically assisted expansion don't usually get as much of a nasal breathing improvement. Uh, another way to get the transverse discrepancy in the surgical cases is where they they split the upper jaw in, in three different pieces, or sometimes even in five different pieces, um, and you know set it in in a different spot, like a like a little mosaic. But that's extremely unstable. Not extremely, but it's unstable and uh, much more likely to relapse. So using MARPI for those pre those surgical cases uh, has you know improved the outcomes dramatically. So in those surgical cases, they're not doing like a cut on the midline sutural area as a MARPI. Okay, as a MARPI. Right. right, exactly. So so it became what, the, what you know, sometimes they, for orthognotic cases, they will split the maxilla in three to five pieces. Yeah. Uh, let's say three generally, if they have to fix the transfer discrepancy. So um, uh, now it became single piece versus three pieces. It's uh, much much safer surgery, also. Okay. okay, so so maybe in a pre-surgical patient, you would do Marpy, and then after they've got the transverse, then they would go in for the jaw surgery. Yep, exactly. Yeah. That's how it usually goes. Okay, um, that's interesting. And how often do you combine the MARPI with a reverse pull face mask or any other thing to grow that jaw forward? Uh, whenever there is whenever there is a pull for it. So if there is a if there is an AP discrepancy, we use face mask. And uh, I know there is a you know some some people use it indiscriminately, and then it's not always warranted or or necessary, or sometimes it could create a problem. Uh, so, you know, I, I've, I've just seen on some, um, you know, comments and, and, and posts, some people say, okay, we did the MARPI and we did the face mask and look how the upper jaw came forward. And now they have a giant overjet that they have to fix and they okay. can't fix it. Okay. So, uh, so, so it has to be a certain type. It's, so it's, I wouldn't, you know, it's not how often I use, it's just in cases that call for it, I use it. So would it would an adult be able to get forward growth after Marpy plus? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So so I've had, I have I have quite a number of adults with the uh, have they have mild underbites, even in one in a couple of severe uh, underbite cases where we were able to bring the upper jaw forward enough to correct the underbite. Okay. So is it true that by um, using <laughs> Marpy? It's now kind of loosening the sutures so you can, so the reverse pull face mask will work on an adult versus you can't just stick a reverse pull face mask without. So how right. does that work technically like the suture with the sutures and being able to get the forward growth after the MARP with the um, So you you have, when, when the MARP loosens up all the sutural connections, it, actually the entire mid face, okay. uh, it's not just the maxilla. So, so essentially, and then there is an ortho, you know, by using a face mask, you create an orthopedic force, uh, displacing upper jaw, uh, and actually hold mid face forward. And a lot of patients who do that, they get a little bit of an improvement in their cheekbones. Okay. Um, that, okay. To... Installing the Marpy, it's splitting the midline pal palatal suture, but all the other sutures are loosening in that process. Yeah, uh, that's well, correct. Okay, that's great. Um, do you find the reverse pull face mask mask is painful or really uncomfortable? No. Okay, uncomfortable, uncomfortable to some degree, not painful. Okay, the pressure. Is there a particular reverse pull face mask that you prefer for your patients? Uh, just a regular standard face mask. Sometimes uh, there is also a couple of variations on the market that you know don't rest on the lower jaw they rest on the chest uh one is bow one is crane but uh you know whatever gets the upper jaw forward okay or there's like the cheek born like the the cheek the grumman's one i goes here yeah that's that's, that's a that's a no-no <laughs> okay and why that will push back or what 
Because because when you use an upper when the upper jaw comes forward, everything comes forward, including the mid face, even in the cheekbones. So if you put the pressure on the cheekbones, you're basically limiting of how far you can bring things forward. What about the traditional reverse pull face mask that puts the pressure on the chin? Is that going to push the lower jaw back? Uh, no, I mean it does, but uh, not 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 back enough to you know. It's just it's still there's still enough resistance from the jaw joints. Okay. Um, it, it's, the developing a TMJ problem certainly could be a, a, a potential side effect of that. Okay. Um, and then what about once you get the expansion on the upper, how do you match the lower jaw with that expansion? That's an excellent question. Uh, same story. I see sometimes people, po you know, put posts, mm -hmm. they done expansion and they have no clue how to match the bottom. A lot of times in, in the upper jaw that's narrow, uh, lower, lower molars will have an inclination towards the tongue. So when, when you expand the top, you need to upright the lower molars, uh, and that's how you get the width uh, of the lower match the width of the top. Now, in some patients, they're not inclined, so for that, you will need to do something as called as FOT, or other used to be known as vulcodontics. It's basically a curdicotomy with the bone grafting uh, that will allow you to move the teeth a little bit beyond their skeletal envelope. Okay. So you so, either upright the teeth if they're like lingually inclined, or mm -hmm. if you have, would it be possible to also do the surgically facilitated on the lower to get even more expansion on the upper? Some do, but I really don't find that necessary. I've never seen it being necessary. Uh, and there's also potentially uh, some very unpleasant side effects because when you split the lower jaw this way and you start expanding the, uh, the mandible, you know, you get rotation and twists uh, uh, at the condyle, at the condyles. At the, even though some people claim it doesn't, it nothing, I don't, I, I don't buy it. Um, I know some people who, who do the chin splits. Um, I, I in, in the past, in cases that I did see, there was always some issue with the jaw joints. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because I know some are firm believers in if you're going to do the skeletal expansion on the upper, you have to do a surgical on the lower. Otherwise, I mean, you're winning total expansion. It, I mean, the SFOT, the vulcodontics, cardiacotomies with the bone grafting on, uh, uh, done on the lower, can, can, I, I have, I've never seen a problem. Ex I've never seen anybody that narrow that that could not be done that way. And it's, okay. much safer, it's a much safer procedure, much more predictable than splitting a chin. Okay, can you describe what that is, the cord economy? The, the, how, what is the word, the what, wolfodonics? What, what was it? Uh, so the, right now, current most accepted term is SFOT, surgically mm -hmm. facilitated orthodontic uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, before it became SFOT, uh, it, it was uh, uh, something that was called Wilkodontics. Uh, there okay. was two brothers, Wilco. Uh, Tom and Bill, Thomas Periodontist, Bill is an orthodontist, and they pioneered that uh, SFOT procedure back in the back in the sixties, actual seventies. They started doing it uh, a very you know long, long time ago, and then at, at, at that time they were you know they were called wax hacks and and, and what what not by their uh, by their peers, uh, but they stuck with it. They did a lot of research, and now it's. You know, especially last decade or so, they've been lecturing everywhere and there's tons of publications and, and proving that, that that technique does work. Um, so, so it used to be Wilkodontics, the official, also there's another term, the scientific term is PAOO, Periodontally Accelerated Osteogenic Orthodontics. Uh, so because it's, uh, you know, periodontal procedure that accelerates the tooth movement and allows you to push the teeth a little bit beyond their uh, you know, physiological limit. So what do you mean? Into, like the gums? And so what yeah, is so, that? So they, they do, they, they lift the gums. Uh, they do, you know, for lack of a better term, like little cuts around the teeth and between the teeth. Okay. And then they, they lay down the bone graft and then they close, uh, you know, close the flap back. And essentially you have a, a flap, a gum flap, you know, gingival gum flap on one side, gum flap on the other side. And and inside and the tooth is in the middle and it's a mush, not the mush that you know in, in, that you could just poke through, but but it's in, in physiological terms it loses calcium so it becomes moldable. Okay. So then you move the tooth with that mush to a new position 
and that after a few couple of months it recalcifies. Oh, so uh, so that's that's how that essentially you know SFT one hundred and one. No, <laughs> that's that, how that, works. that makes perfect. That is really understandable because I didn't really know how that process works. So then, how do they move on the lower? Are they using what type of expanders on the lower? Oh yeah, you could use multiple things. You could use, an, uh, a, a, you know, just an expander. You could use braces. You could use Invisalign. Uh, anything that will push the teeth sideways, and you know, you could use. Okay, and um, so a technique like a surgically facilitated technique is what age would that start to be applicable for? Um, anybody who's got the, all of their permanent teeth, I would, okay. I, I should say, you know, I, I've, I've, I've done it. Well, you know, a long time ago and even 13 year old. So that would be the, my earliest. And then what about, um, so if the teeth are lingually inclined and you don't do a surgically facilitated treatment, but you want to end the case with Invisalign, like this is something I'm having right now. Um, I never had expansion as a child. I just had a headgear and braces. And so, you know, so now I um, did the MSC and I'm in Invisalign. So we're just uprighting my teeth because I had yeah. the, right, the skeletal crossbite, but not the dental crossbite. My teeth were perfect looking <laughs> before all this. Okay. Uh, so now with the uprighting, are you, so the the upper teeth are tipped buckly, right? So now we're going to upright them lingually, right? So are you, mm -hmm. do you feel you're losing some of the expansion you gain, some of the skeletal expansion when you upright the teeth? Well, no, you're not but you need skeletal, but losing total expansion. Uh, true, but, but you need to account for that when you plan your expansion, right? So let's say you need to expand 10 millimeters, but you know when you upright your teeth, you're going to lose five, then you need to expand more. So to account for that, for that uh, uprighting. Okay. It's all, it all has to be planned out properly. Okay. So it's expected. Yes. You're losing some of that total expansion, but you've expanded more to compensate for that. That okay. is right. I'm writing notes here. So account for the uprating. Okay. This is great. Um, let's see. What about the concept change from like straightening teeth to kind of changing structure and function and breathing? Did you have um, like a change in your career with that or how, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I was never a mainstream orthodontist, as you called it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was always trying to go the site, uh, you know, on a separate different road. You know, early in my practice, you know, I started off with, uh, you know, trying to coordinate teeth and joints and uh, airway was kind of always to a slight degree was it was it was certainly there um but uh, it it just became mainstream more recently uh my one of my jobs that i held in, in college and dental school is i'm a polysomnography technician i did sleep tests oh. for a living so so uh you know w what breathing is and what sleep apnea is was kind of very near and dear yeah um, and again and when when you start doing the cases and you and you hear the first anecdotal reports and then you get you send patients for sleep tests and 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 they uh come back and they, they you know they report an improvement on the actual sleep tests not just you know oh i got I, not 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 self-reported symptoms but the actual scientific proof that what you've done actually worked uh so that's kind of you know became no-brainer yeah. um so that's that's how that's how that's how my story went. It started with you know with just treating uh, joy joints and uh, teeth and uh, airway just you know became big part of it. But I, I I can't say I don't like the term airway orthodontist or airway dentist. That implies you don't treat anything else. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it has to be a comprehensive uh, approach. You know you yep. can't treat airway at the expense of uh, you know teeth falling out. You know. Right. Right. That makes sense. And that's interesting that you were a sleep technician before that. I wonder how rare that is, you know, for that to be a before you did your orthodontic uh, residency or whatever. That's interesting. So do you have yeah. patients do a sleep study before and after your treatment or do you kind of keep it solely on this is the width we're getting? This is a skeletal. This is what I'm doing. And the sleep portion of that, leave that to the sleep doctor. How do you how do you incorporate that? So, so it, that's a, that's a great, an excellent question. So, first, the, the orthodontic diagnosis comes first, and if the patient has an error or maxilla, and they do have sleep symptoms, 
Marpy will be my uh, Marpy will be part of my plan, whether they did sleep tests or not. So I'm, I'm, I'm treating the orthodontic diagnosis uh, primarily, um, and uh, just just because we, you know, even though we talk about airway, we expanding airway and we are affecting airway uh, in 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 a in a in a legal arena in in court, so to speak. Uh, you can't say you treat it for for an airway because there is just it's not a, a mainstream uh, research proven. It's getting there, but it's not not yet. Um, so, so you have to treat or what you've been trained for, which is an orthodontic problem. Um, and then airway is a big part of it, but you know, you can't just like, like I just said, can't treat airway at the expense of everything else. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, that orthotics diagnosis comes first, sleep diagnosis comes second. I, I work with the local sleep lab and sometimes they send patients, uh, for the expansion and, and sometimes patients come in and they don't need an expansion. They just need a you know, by maxillary advancement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes, sometimes they 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 don't sleep. Completely different reasons. You know, sometimes a vitamin deficiency, or I'll tell you a very funny story. As a sleep technician, uh, we I, we had a patient who was um, uh, uh, who who came in. He literally was sleepwalking, and uh, he he came to the to, to our practice, and uh, uh, we we set him up in a in a in a clinic in a sleep lab. And he slept like a baby. And he said that was the best sleep he's ever gotten. Mm-hmm. And then he went home and was back in the clinic a couple of weeks later. He said, I don't know what happened. So we had a home, you know, home uh, system. So I, I went to his house. I set him up, put a little camera, uh, you know, to, and, and then set the recording. And guess what? His, his wife had a restless leg syndrome. So she was kicking him all night long. And kept, you know, she was his sleep apnea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh! So then that would wake him up. It's so funny. Yeah, say- but but he was he he so you know they've been married for for many years. So so he's been, uh, you know, she's been doing that. To, he, he he would be literally unconscious. She would kick him. He would turn. He would, she would kick him again. He'd turn again. So she kept him awake, subconscious, just like sleep apnea does. But uh, you know he would sleep hours at a time, and then he would just wake up, and his like it was ne- would never be rested until he went to a sleep lab. I know, and you know so that is so funny. He's like, "Could I sleep here again?" He needs to sleep in a separate bed. I mean, it is true. Like yeah. the problems, like bed partners. I mean, it really is. It's interesting how probably people yeah. think it's a lot worse when you get married. You got your bed partner. I just did an evaluation on Friday. And the patient has insomnia. It takes him about three hours to fall asleep. He also has sleep apnea. So we have two different things going on. And he told me um, he used to grind his teeth, but he doesn't anymore, which is a whole other conversation. But his wife grinds her teeth so she wears a night guard. And I'm thinking, she's probably potentially grinding her teeth because of you keeping her awake. Because what happens is the second he falls asleep after a few (laughs) hours, he snores, she Mm -hmm. elbows him. That dynamic, they are both probably so unwell rested, and ju- you know exactly. It, so sleep apnea, sleep disorders affect the whole family, you know. <laughs> so, so, so just think about it this way: this patient comes in and he says, I, "I, I can't sleep well. I need, I need a palate expander, you know, because you've read, I read online that it's going to improve my sleep and breathing, and and you do, and you do an expansion, and it does nothing for them because that's not the problem." Is not the problem exactly. So you have to do the orthodontic um, diagnosis first, which right. of course, yeah, you have to do the whole diagnosis first. In, yeah. you know, and and uh, absolutely. And I see, I get so many patients that have narcolepsy, and I refer them to the sleep doctor, and that gets diagnosed. So there's so many problems that are not airway related. So we can't always focus on skeletal expansion because that might not be appropriate for all these patients. So that is that is, that is correct. That makes perfect sense. And um, one thing, when I, you were talking about sleep studies, I did my sleep study before I got my expander and I did the PEZ sleep study, which is with the pharyngeal esophageal manometry. So that was uh, like the gold standard for diagnosing upper airway resistance syndrome because a regular in lab sleep study said my AHI was zero. I just had a lot of spontaneous arousals. Um, 
So I did the PES and my AHI was 21.4 with the PES. So every two minutes, my brain would arouse due to a breathing event, right? That increased effort to breathe, brain would arouse, but my oxygen never dropped. So then I got the MSC and pretty much didn't do anything else at the time I had my MSC. And before the MSC was removed, so it was still in, so it pushes the tongue down. So your, your breathing's not going to be as good. I did another PES sleep study and my HI went from 21.4 to six just with that expansion. So um, yeah. that was, in, that was, that was pretty telltale and with a PES study, which is the, you know, the most fine tuned. So that was really interesting. So that, that was proof for me. Um, and I was able to get off CPAP from, um, with, from the MSC. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so that was great. A question about, um, jaw joints. So is there, by doing that expansion with the Tadborn, does that affect the TMJ at all? I mean, I'm um, pulling everything wider. So how does it fit correctly? Uh, well, you need, that's, it needs to be managed properly orthodontically for that. Uh, so, you, you know, you get the lower tipping, you get the upper tipping. So you need to plan for some intrusion. You basically, you know, it needs to, you need to rebuild the whole bite. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and a couple more uh, questions or just a comment here that I just had a patient, a nine-year-old who has moderate sleep apnea, and I read the sleep study report and there is CPAP was a recommendation. Myofunctional therapy is a recommendation, which is great because we didn't use to, they didn't used to put that on reports, but there was no yeah. orthodontic treatment recommendation. And I'm just kind of blown away because this child never had orthodontics, never had an expander. He is um, crowded, you know, transverse deficient. And I just find that really crazy that a sleep physician would um, diagnose sleep apnea and not have orthodontics as a treatment? Uh, they're just not aware. They're just not aware. Wow. Yeah. You, you know, for, for most physicians, anything above the neck does not exist, right? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's just it just blows my mind because that is the cure, right? We need to... Yes. It's sleep disordered breathing is an anatomical problem in most cases, especially in a child. we got to grow the jaws forward. I mean... Yeah, maybe CPAP temporarily might be important for a certain individual, but or when we're talking about a child. But wow, I was just uh, really shocked. Um, so I'm glad this parent found me because I was able to guide, you know, to the right people to help fix this, yeah. to help this child. Um, okay, so Dr. Ting wanted me to ask you a couple questions. One, what do you see as the future of orthodontics? <laughs> uh, future of orthodontics will, will uh, there will be huge places, practices uh, where people will still do their conventional drill, fill, and bill, uh, line up the social six and get them out of the door. Uh, it will be huge, you know, uh, corporate practices, you know, DSOs, um, whatever, uh, that, and, and then there will be little guys like uh, me and Richard. <laughs> that, that will be that that you know we we for what I, I i like to think of ourselves as we trying to do be not just tooth jockeys but uh you know actually uh do some sort of a it's a it more becomes more of a healthcare profession rather than just uh tooth aligning yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so, I, so I think i, I think there will be very few in the middle so most people who really want to do take it to the next level will get, get education and you know join airway and 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 treat the entire head and neck and some guys just will still line up the social six which for some people will be quite acceptable as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep um, I have a question from Dr. Ting, but let me say one other thing. This is what I saw on the Facebook post. Uh, maybe I can throw in here. Somebody said about palo expanders. Dr. Lipkin says that slow expansion only moves teeth, whereas fast expans expansion is a skeletal expansion. Um, and they put some examples. For the conventional expander. And then For the conventional expander in a child. Okay. So a conventional expander in a child. So can So can you explain that? Yeah, so so sometimes people have a term that like a slow expansion, or uh, essentially it's it's they use either conventional palate expander or removable expansion devices, uh, and that uh, so because the force generated is not enough to split the the, the maxillary suture, 
maybe just to some very, very limited degree. So they're basically remodeling the alveolar support for the teeth. They're basically just they're expanding the dental arch. They're not expanding the maxilla. Right. Agreed. And they put some examples of appliances, but the, some people would call those like growth guidance appliances or, and it's more like a tipping of the teeth versus yes. expanding the bone. Okay. That is correct. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of, um, appliances like uh you know the dna alf and and all that and and, and I, I have a couple of very negative words about those appliances but they're all tooth moving appliances essentially and uh they don't do what people claim they do and and, and because I, I i i've retreated and i get them in my practice so often uh you know people who use those uh appliances and then now the teeth are sticking out of the ears literally yeah uh, and that was and the, those the, those were the examples. They said Vivos DNA, ALF. Um, so is there a place for any of those um, for what, quote unquote growth guidance appliances or not? If you want to move teeth, that's what you use. Okay. I mean, you could, you could, there's nothing you cannot accomplish with Invisalign or braces that you can accomplish with Vivos or DNA or ALF. It's a tooth moving appliance. They're not um, just very, very simple. Oh. I mean, and then if anyone wants to contradict me on that, Give me a proof. I, I, I. Any time I spoke to any of those, you know, DNA health or growth God, uh, modified growth devices, uh, they have never been able to show me the proof, like a, on a comb beam, that they have changed skeletal structure. Not a single time. Mm -hmm. Good. So, That's so good. yeah, the teeth might look even. They might even look good in 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 the beginning, but long term, they're not in the bone very often, or tipped, or occlusion is horrible. And uh, a couple of years later down the road, they'll have all, all sorts of other problems. Yeah, that's good information. And I remember uh, Dr. Stanley Liu had said about when you're expanding at the midline palatal suture, your the bone is growing back. You're growing bone, right? At that expansion, the bone. So think about what happens when you grow bone, he said. You're growing now the nasal floor mucosa, nitric oxide production, like the nose is going to function better. And that was a really good visual for me too, to also think about that versus, oh, yep. we're keeping teeth outwards. Okay. So the last question from doc, this one's from Dr. Ting that says, how can a patient get the best out of the orthodontist and how can a patient find a good orthodontist? Uh, reputation and, uh, you know, talk, talk to the, I mean, talk to the peers. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, um, just you, you, many, many, many good orthodontists take multiple courses. They never stop learning. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you think you know it all, then then you're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so so it, it never. You know, I've been doing this for twenty some years, and I, I I still find something that I either overlooked, didn't know. Sometimes things surprise me. So uh, I, I don't think I'll ever know it all. And then I keep learning just like everyone else. And, and uh, I think a trait of a good orthodontist, they need to, they just, they need to focus on uh, the whole skeletal system as, as a whole, you know, joints, aesthetics, occlusion, function, uh, airway. It, it has to, there has to be a list of goals that the orthodontist should set to achieve. And if there's some of this, some, sometimes we are able to achieve all the goals. Sometimes some of them have to be compromised on. But, uh, um, you know, if, 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 the, if the patient comes to an orthodontist, they pick up an x-ray and the treatment plan is braces, then run. <laughs> mm -hmm. There you go. That's great. Yep. <laughs> really great. Well, thank you so much for your time because this was so enlightening. And I think I forgot to say in the beginning, but you did Renat and Ami's uh, Marpy treatment, right? From uh, Yes, yeah, she was just in the office yesterday. We just started her upper, upper, uh, upper in the joint. How great. And she posted pictures before and after, and you can see all the dental and facial changes. Um, yeah. And she just looks like she's glowing. It's so great. So kind of to sum up some things from our conversation, um, we talked about Marpy, and you've even done Marpy on a five-year-old up to 63-year-old, but there really isn't an age limit. And your cases are all very successful. When you use a piezo, you're I don't want to say guaranteed, but almost guaranteed we're getting that split in the success. And the success of a skeletal expander is that midline palatal suture split. That's um, right. Perfect. And you can go from two tads in a little child up to eight tads in an adult. Um, I've seen somebody do 10. I mean, uh, wow. I, I haven't had a case where I needed 10, but 
you never know. (laughs) That's a mouthful, 10 tabs. Wow. Um, But whatever's needed. Um, And I also learned that when we do the transverse expansion, the upper jaw is displaced slightly forward and it's small amount, but there is a little bit of forward displacement. And my brain just goes to think um, the Pousseau's law of aerodynamics, any slight change in the tube, any slight growth is to the power of four. So we might say it's slight, but that could have potentially a significant impact on someone's breathing. Sure. Little things like that. Okay. Um, the piezo for you in your case is a male would be like age uh, 25 and a female age 30. Um, when, when there's a jaw surgery technique, like an MMA surgery, the cuts are going to be different than when we do a mark beat where the cut is on the midline pelvis suture. So it's kind of, it could be beneficial to do a MARPI before a double jaw surgery case. Um, when we do skeletal expander, all the facial sutures are loosening. So we can actually then do a reverse pull face mask in an adult or child, but it's not probably as neat in a child, but an adult because you've loosened those sutures and get some AP growth that way. Yeah, well, in a child, you can get a significant change. Uh, you know, in someone who is you know, prepubertal or, or around the puberty, um, uh, that, that you can get a tremendous change. Like uh, even with well, just RPE, right? Though even well, just with, RPE and no, no, not no, no, it, specifically with RPE and the face mask. Okay. Like with somebody who's got an underbite, you could you could advance that upper jaw forward quite a lot. Great. Okay. Um, and when we're kind of lining up the upper and lower jaws in a skull upper maxillary skeletal expander technique, you can upright the teeth in the bone um, using like Invisalign or a surgically facilitated orthodontic technique like the Wilkodonics or the PAOO will involve corticotomy on the lower jaw that some patients might need for a long time. Uh, run, 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 yeah, just, uh, you know, he's, yeah. He's also one of, happens to be one of my patients currently. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, so, so he just did uh, that Wilkodonic procedure on, on one of his quadrants. Um, on upper. So he, on the upper. So he just posted a video of the whole process. That is so funny because I just saw that. I didn't watch the video, but I just saw it said that he just had like a surgical technique. I was like, now what did he do? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that he saw you. Okay, so I got to watch that video. So he is yeah. he does jaw hacks. So I did an interview with him. I know you've done a few interviews with him. So this will be interesting to see his how he did the SFOT because I think he had asymmetry, right? Is that why? Yeah, so he had an, uh, not with me, but he had, uh, uh, an, you know, MSC, uh, uh, he, he, I think he had every every appliance <laughs> yeah. in the book. He started with the AGA, <laughs> I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So so, so he's, 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 thought, he's done a lot of stuff. And then, and then uh, finally, he, he had an MSC, I don't know where, but uh, at some point ended up in my office uh, uh, last year. So we started him on, on, a, on, a, on a path to get his upper teeth, but he's got some, Skeletal asymmetry post expansion, where one side I I could not fix without doing something like SFOT. So uh, that's why he went and had it done. So this way we could move these teeth a little bit further out in comparison to everything else. So is that common to get skeletal asymmetry with MSC or MARPI, or if the provider's good, that won't happen? I shouldn't say. Let's that. put it this way: it, it really should not happen. It should so, not. Ma- ma- yeah, yeah. My, my person, my and I'm sure you probably heard me say that on, on one of the runs videos. I, 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 and a lot of times people post skeletal symmetry expansion cases, and I think it, it's either misdiagnosed or incorrectly ex- installed uh, okay. device. Okay, C- can you correct an asymmetry um, using Marpy? Sometimes. Okay. Okay, that's great. Okay, I was doing my sum up, and now I'm like, oh, more questions. Okay, <laughs> what's funny about this? Okay, you have no had <laughs> that's so my brain goes so many ways because it's so fascinating. Um, you've had a hundred percent success rate using the piezo and Marpy over the last two years. All your patients, the suture has split. That Every single one. Amazing, wonderful, and your office is in New Jersey, right? Yep. Right. That sounds so great. Well, I really appreciate all this information, you taking the time in the middle of your day to educate the audience. We have maybe patients that might listen, but also a lot of providers, professionals, um, myofunctional therapists, dentists, orthodontists, dental hygienists, all everybody. So um, we really learn a lot from you. So I appreciate your time. My pleasure. 
Thank you so much. My pleasure. It's great to have Gary talking to you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Bye.